Welcome to Jubilee Campaign's United Nations Human Rights Council external virtual event organized in parallel to the 46th session of the UN Human Rights Council. This event is themed Grant Every Child Every Right in the People's Republic of China. I am Anne Bawal, the Executive Director of Jubilee Campaign. This parallel event is convened to flag that China is now two years late in submitting their state party report to the Committee on the Rights of a Child. In addition, today, March 2nd, marks exactly 29 years since China uh, ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of a Child. Since China's ratification of the convention, however, and you will learn throughout today's event, that the Chinese Communist Party is consistently and increasingly violating the right of the child to freedom of religion or belief, especially in regards to children of Christian, Falun Gong, Tibetan Buddhist, and Uyghur backgrounds. Following the implementation of the regulations on religious affairs in 2018, provincial governments have banned minors from attending uh, any religious-based activities and questioned students about their faith at school. That's deplorable. These recently introduced restrictions blatantly disregard the committee's recommendations and the rights protected under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. As next year marks the 30th anniversary of China's ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and its second year in the Human Rights Council, it is incumbent upon China to take the previous recommendations of the committee seriously and to cooperate with UN bodies and civil society members to grant every child every right, including the freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. We're honored today to have a group of distinguished speakers and brave witnesses. Each are willing to share their personal experiences and expertise regarding persecution of children of religious and spiritual backgrounds in China. We're honored today as our first speaker will be the distinguished member uh, commissioner of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, Mr. Nuri Turkel. Commissioner Turkel is the first US educated Uyghur American attorney and human rights advocate. And in September of last year, he was recognized in Time, Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people in the world. Commissioner Turkle was born in Kashgar, Zhengjiang, in a re-education camp during the Cultural Revolution. And since his relocation to the US, he's become, um, the most prominent Uyghur American activist and a legal representative of Uyghur refugees seeking asylum in the United States. Commissioner Turco formerly served as the president of the Uyghur American Association, and he's currently serving as chairman of the board for Uyghur Human Rights Project. In addition, Commissioner Turco acts as a legal advisor to the World Uyghur Congress. Commissioner Turkle, thank you so much for joining us today, and we welcome you to share your remarks. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Nuri Turkel, and I serve as a commissioner on the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF. We are a bipartisan independent advisory body that makes recommendations to the President of the United States the Secretary of State and Congress on ways to advance freedom of religion and belief worldwide. Our nine commissioners are appointed by the majority and minority party leaders of Congress and by the president. While we are an independent US government agency, we monitor religious freedom according to international standards, including religious freedom protection outlined in Article 18 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. On May 1 of each year, 
USERF releases an annual report which makes recommendations to the United States State Department on countries to either designate as countries of particular concern, or CPCs, or to place on this special watch list as mandated by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. CPC countries are the worst violators of religious freedom in the world, committing systematic, ongoing, egregious violations of freedom of religion and belief. And we have recommended China as CPC since our first annual report back in 2000. While China's religious freedom violations have long attracted significant international attention, the unique burdens these violations have placed on children are unfortunately often overlooked. Therefore, I'm truly grateful to the Jubilee Campaign for organizing this important side event to specifically discuss China's policies that violate the religion, religious freedom of children. I will focus my remarks on the plight of ethnic and religious minority children, particularly in China. First, I'd like to touch upon some of the broader context of China's repression of ethno-religious ethno minority groups that inevitably and significantly impacts ethnic minority children. First of all, the communist government of China continues to pursue a policy of forced assimilation and suppression of its ethnic and religious minorities through its sinicization campaign. In ethnic minority regions such as Tibet, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and Inner Mongolia, China's authorities have imposed Mandarin as the language of teaching and replacing local languages despite opposition from the minority groups. The survival of culture, language, religion of these communities are increasingly threatened due to the government's arbitrary policies. Chinese authorities have carried out campaign to destroy and damage religious sites that are important to Uyghur and Tibetan, as well as the other religious minorities in China. They have placed tight restrictions on monasteries, temples, and mosques, banning worshippers from entering these sites, including those uh, who are under age 18 or enrolling in schools. Since 2017, the government has also detained millions of Uyghur, Kazakh, and other Turkic Muslims in concentration camps in the Uyghur region, known, uh, otherwise known as Xinjiang. In doing so, it often targets individuals engaged in practicing Islam or pra expressing their Muslim identity, such as growing beard or wearing wheel as well as for so-called family planning violations. Former detainees have reported that they suffered torture, rape, forced abortion and sterilization, pol political indoctrination, and other abuses in those camps. And, the, and in the process of carrying out these atrocities, the Chinese government has separated as many as half million Uyghur children from their detained parents and send them to state-run orf orphanages or boarding schools, where they're forced to praise Xi Jinping and China's Communist Party for the happy life that the Chinese authorities has given to them. Chinese laws and regulations explicitly ban minors under the age of 18 from participating in religious activities, including in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region, and Tibet Autonomous Region, as well as Inner Mongolia. This is affecting the children of uh, Uyghur origin and others who are deprived of their cultural rights to learn about their religion and their uh, language in particular. There have been reports that the authorities have banned religion in school, including on university and camp uh, college campuses. This broad overview provides uh, an evidence that the Chinese uh, uh, communist government has violated basic principles of freedom of religion as set out in the Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which China is a party. In addition, Article 24 of the ICCPR provides that every child shall have, a, shall have without any discrimination as to race, color, sex, language, religion, national or social origin, prop, uh, property or birth, the right to such measures of protection 
as are required by his status as a minor on part of his family, society, and the state. As you can plainly see, Chinese Communist Party's policies and their specific impact on ethnic religious minority children in those minority regions constitute direct and egregious violations of international standards. In addition, as a member of the UN Human Rights Council, China should be held to the highest standard expected of any country participating in that body. The kind of abuses that the Chinese government has committed against religious and ethnic minority groups, particularly children, are unconscionable and deserves worldwide condemnation and governmental actions individually or collectively. I call on the international community, including governments and civil society actors, to continue to hold China accountable for its abusive policies. Thank you again for organizing this important event and allow me to have a chance to discuss some of these horrific uh, 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 policies being implemented uh, specifically on children in uh, communist China today. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Turkle, for your uh, testimony and description of the deplorable treatment of the Uyghur religious minorities. It is truly shocking. And the fact that China is, it has such a position of uh, influence within the Human Rights Council is also truly shocking in light of its deplorable human rights violations that you've described. And we have additional witnesses today that will describe more uh, uh, specific incidences that occur within their own communities. I would like everyone who has questions to be able to pose those. At the end, we will have a question and answer period. Now, um, there, there should be within uh, GoToMeeting platform that we're using today, uh, there should be a visible sidebar in which you can type your question. There's a question box. So we look forward to receiving your questions so that we can uh, ask them towards the end of our presentation today. Our next speaker, who is joining us in today's event, entitled, Grant Every Child Every Right in the People's Republic of China, is Bob Fu. Bob Fu himself is a survivor of persecution many years ago. Um, it's been, he's been well-known and renowned advocate of the freedom of religion and expression within China. He's the founder and president of China Aid. He's a former student leader during the Tiananmen Square democracy movement in 1989. In 1993, he graduated with a law degree on international relations from Renmin University in China, Beijing. He's also faculty member of the Beijing Party School of the CCP from 1993 to 1996. He was a house church leader in Beijing until his wife and he were imprisoned in 1996. In 1997, he was exiled to the United States. Um, he graduated with a PhD from St. John's College at the University of Durham in the UK, um, and his focus is the field of religious freedom. We would like to welcome uh, Bob Fu to provide uh, his perspective and information regarding uh, this important topic. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne, uh, for again, the Jubilee campaign uh, for organizing this timely event. And I appreciate the remark uh, by Commissioner uh, Turkel for um, pointing out how the children in the China's minority groups, their rights, their religious freedom had been violated. I will focus on um, specific, specific three areas. Uh, number one, from the legislative perspective, the Chinese uh, communist regime uh, used the uh, so-called uh, legislative means, the, the, the laws, to enshrine 
is um, absolute violation of Chinese children's religious freedom rights. Number two is um, from the executive action perspective, from the central government to the provincial government to local government, the Chinese uh, regime had used its executive actions by um, uh, reading off, uh, forbidding the, not only the children, uh, but also their parents uh, by punishing their parents for violating the children's rights. The um, third point I will make is uh, on the practical side. Uh, we have seen the a number of cases showing how those violations, discriminations are being uh, mandated uh, in, for, in the local government. Number one, the, from the legislative perspective, uh, although the Chinese government had signed um, the various international covenants um, declaring the guarantee of um, religious freedom for every citizen, uh, including the Article 36 of China's constitution, and um, many other uh, legislations prescribing, um, declaring that uh, somehow the People's Republic of China would guarantee its citizens religious freedom. But uh, if we examine um, carefully about um, some of the provisions uh, from the constitution to those like uh, uh, in, 19, in 2018 passage of uh, the new regulation on religious affairs uh, to even the so-called uh, the compulsive uh, uh, education laws. It all contain a specific uh, uh, clause, a provision uh, declaring the no religion or religious personnel uh, should use religion to interfere the state's education. So this specific clause actually uh, it had been used very, very widely as a way to forbid any children, any children from elementary school mm -hmm. to uh, junior high, senior high schools to have any access to religion. So especially after President Xi Jinping took power, we have seen among 235 million Chinese children from elementary school to high school studying in, uh, in uh, their education institutions in China, every one of them is forbidden to get access to any religious education, religious materials, every religious institutions. We're talking about Protestant Christian churches, Catholic churches, uh, Muslim mosques, Buddhist temples, any religious institution or buildings had very specifically uh, was instructed with the clear banners outside and inside their buildings, declaring a no entry zone, basically for any children under 18 years old. Nobody's allowed to enter into these uh, religious institutions. So this is a clear violation of uh, the children's rights of uh, freedom of religion. And the Associated Press and the Wall Street Journal and many other mainstream media had sent 
its journalists to these uh, various provinces and close to the proximity of those religious institutions and had documented that clearly. And number two, the Chinese regime had even forbid the access of uh, religious materials of uh, all these teachers. So we have seen in uh, March 2020 in Inner Mongolia, in November 2020 in Zhejiang province, all these teachers are mandated and forced to sign a pledge, a pledge that they will never uh, believe in any religion, they will never spread any religion, they will never allow any of those children in their classroom to have any religious belief. In Wenzhou city, Zhejiang province, there has been even a campaign to disclose, to force these children, these Christian children or any other children carrying a religious faith to believe, I mean, to, to disclose the religion. And then the state from the school administration, and then finally, to the police forces were invited to the classroom and one by one threaten every one of these children who disclose their religious faith to renounce their faith. They were asked and forced to sign a form, a Communist Party prepared form. For the first time since the Cultural Revolution, every one of these children were forced to sign a form to renounce their faith. So you are talking about violation of uh, children's rights for the religion, religious freedom. This is a, a, certainly a clear violation with this uh, administrative means. Number three, we have seen religious personnel, religious personnel are totally restricted to send any instruction or perform any religious ceremonies among those children under 18 years old. It's not only actually uh, to the children under 18 years old, even those in the university classrooms, the, the teachers and students are totally forbidden. We have seen Bishop Jia Dingguo from Henan province, from Hebei province. He was arrested last year. For what? For organizing an orphanage with the children under 18 years old. And they are all disabled children. And Bishop Jia had operating with a group of nuns under his church leadership for 30 years of that orphanage. And he was arrested for, re for his refusal to sign a form to forbid children under 18, I mean, even disabled children in his orphanage. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have seen this nationwide ban of uh, uh, those children from uh, being receiving any religious instruction materials from the clergyman. Otherwise, this clergyman, their parents, if the parent chose to send their children to a Christian elementary school, despite of uh, permission uh, by the state policy in the past, now these parents are being punished from uh, being arrested to losing their welfare. So we have documented a lot at ChinaAid.org. And so um, the Chinese uh, regime 
uh, uh, certainly enshrined its uh, sanction against the religious freedom of children from the legislative, administrative, and certainly in the religious institutions. So the whole international community should condemn unequivocally on this uh, brutal violation of uh, both the children and their parents' rights for their children's religious freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for um, your explanation. The bans that you describe on minors from attending worship services is such a clear violation of the international covenants which China has signed. Thanks for providing the context of the provisions uh, such as that 2018 Religious Affairs Regulation. It's repulsive. Forbidding any children from elementary to senior high to have any access to religion is truly deplorable and it's a violation of the CPC's uh, conventions. Um, and finally, these no entry zone restrictions on churches is likewise in contravention of international law. So we appreciate your explanation of uh, where these violations are taking place and the examples on how it impacts even educators. We will next hear from such a teacher that you reference. Um, Esther has suffered greatly on account of the government sudden crackdown on teachers. Esther is a former kindergarten school teacher who's been persecuted and imprisoned for her faith and simply for providing curriculum uh, to children that had an educational religious angle to it. After she became a member of the beloved church in Guangzhou and teacher of the Woodland Kindergarten, Esther was repeatedly summoned and interrogated by the Educational Bureau authorities regarding whether she was teaching her students Christianity or not, or using Christian materials. Um, she was encouraged to give up her faith and to stop teaching. Following Esther's release from a days long detention period, she realized that she and her husband would never be free as Christians in China, and she too had to flee. Right now, we're going to turn the mic over to Esther so that she can share her testimony and what, what she faced in China. Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne. Hello, so my name is Esther and I would like to tell you all my story. Oh, of Esther, if you could please share your webcam. Oh, sorry, already shared. Thank you, Anne. So hello, my name is Esther, and I would like to tell you all my story of the persecution I faced at the hand of Chinese government for my Christian faith and my work as a kindergarten principal. Though my mother was a Christian, I was not a religious child. While I was in school, I was constantly taught was atheism was the only correct way of thinking and because my father was an atheist, I did not confer becoming Christian until later in my life. In 2007, however, an incident changed my entire life and renewal of Christian identity. I was in a serious car accident while I was traveling to Beijing with my family. It was snowing heavily and our car flapped it upside down into a nearby ditch. We were extremely lucky to have survived. One of the people who helped us told me that just two days later, early, a similar accident left four people dead. I began to wonder if there was a God who had given us grace and we emerged humans from such a dangerous event. In the same year, when I was 25, I met two Christian sisters at my workplace because I was interested. The uh, three of us together would study the Bible daily. 
eventually enjoyed the sister as a member of beloved church in Guangzhou. I was officially be baptized in July 2007. The persecution and problems I faced in China are the result of my Christian faith and the way I choose to practice it. The Christian, the Chinese government looks very unfavorably on religion and they try to control it very tightly. The government gets nervous when they suspect religion is being influenced by outside folks because they view it as a threat to the country and to their power. In 2009, I started working at a woodland kindergarten where I was surrounded by many the other Christian employees. We taught our young students to be thankful, humble, joyful, and have focus. Our program was not a Christian program. Also, it was influenced by Christian ideals. In 2014, I was arrested and charged with operating an illegal business. For many years before my arrest, the education department did not take issue with the books the school used. The problem was about my faith. In the summer of 2011, our church was working with an American team from Great Commission churches to put on a Christian summer camp program for adults and teenagers. On July 11th, I received a phone call from the education department who asked me to visit their office. One of the education department officers questioned me and encouraged me to give up my face to focus on working at the kindergarten. He asked me to stop my involvement with the church. He also asked me not to involve any university student in our art research. For the most part, the next couple years were peaceful. Also, I would receive phone calls from time to time from the education department asking me to stop planning religious camps for children and inquiring about the kindergartners. In 2014, I was summoned once again to the department office. I was told I would only be questioned for, for 24 hours. And I believe this, for the first hour, all three officers took turn asking me questions. I don't remember all of the questions they asked me, but I know the question or whether the teaching materials are originally from the Bible. They asked me, why are you teaching the children those materials? How many Christian teachers have you employed? Where did you obtain those materials? I was not questioned by a new set of the officials who took me back to the kindergarten to search for any religious or illegal materials. They ended the questioning around 11 p.m. I asked if I could go home. They said no. I asked if I could hire a lawyer. They said no. I slept that night in a questioning room where there was no bed and I was very cold and hungry. The next day, I was transported to a detention center where my real nightmare began. I was forced to work for long hours, sleep on a one bed shared with 16 women and was questioned regularly. One more time, the other people connected with the school were also arrested. I was asked over and over again, do you only have Christian teachers at the school? Is the correct materials based on the Bible? Who was involved in printing the material? It became even more clear that I was being unlawfully punished for two reasons, that I am a Christian and that I taught kindergartners materials based on the Bible. I believe that the Christian government glad that my studies as a Christian and teach was a threat to the ideal of atheism and nationalism that the CCP promotes and prefer to be taught in classroom across 
the nation. After having my uh, my court, hearing since res res respectfully postponed, I was sentenced to two years in prison in April 2015. When I was released, I met up with some of the other employers of the kindergarten, and they informed me that they also were told not work in the field of education. My husband and I knew that we were being watched by the government. So we were cautious about how long we stayed in one location because we didn't want to cause problems for our friends and family. My husband had been working as a full-time minister, but couldn't do this when we needed to move for our safety. Since I am ready have a recorded, my next arrest would be for five years or more. We couldn't live anywhere in China and be safe. We wanted to continue our ministry, but that means we could keep coming to the attention of the Chinese government, putting our family at risk. Eventually, we decided that we had to leave in order to escape persecution and find a place where we could practice our faith freely and peaceful. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for sharing your personal testimony and sharing of your suffering, all of the fear and overwhelming uh, persecution you, you, you suffered with the interrogations, all because you were exercising your Christian faith, including the basic positive ideals of a Christian faith that can be uh, reviewed in a non-religious context. It's just um, amazing that China has a problem with that. Um, thanks for sharing about the unlawful punishment that you suffered. We appreciate your you're joining us today. We know that your time is short and that you, you're, you're going to need to leave our uh, panel, uh, but we want you to know we appreciate you. Our next speaker is Cindy. Cindy's had some technical problems with her uh, video. So we're uh, going to show um, a photograph of her and she'll be providing the audio. Um, Cindy is the daughter of a Falun Gong practitioner. Her father spent uh, many years in prison for his spiritual beliefs for the majority of her childhood. She was unable to spend time with her father or even visit him. Cindy was unable to develop a close relationship because of the fact he was in prison and only learned things about him through her mother. Cindy was only able to meet her father a handful of times. Just 11 days after his final release from prison, Cindy's father passed away as a result of the abuse that he had suffered from while in prison. Cindy, we welcome you to share your story and hopefully we'll be able to hear the audio. If not, we'll try something else, but Cindy, uh, please provide us with and share your testimony. Thank you. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear? Me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Xin Yang Xu. I practice Falun Gong with my parents. Falun Gong is a wonderful mind and body practice based on the principle of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. I spent most of my childhood in fear and flight in China. My dad was jailed for eight years simply for his leave. He was tortured so severely that he passed away 13 days after he was arrested released from the prison. My mother was arrested four times. She was also tortured very badly. Several times she was on the edge of dying. In 2001, my mother found out that she was pregnant with me. While she was detained and tortured in police station in Shenyang. Police 
beat her up badly. They hit her head, head, her back, and her face. She felt very dizzy and nothing, nauseating. She was forced to squat down and a whole for a whole night. Fortunately, she did not have a miscarriage. Otherwise, I would not have come to this world. I was only with my father twice for a total of thirteen days. The first time I met him in person was when I was seven years old. My dad was very skinny, but he was in a good spirit. <laughs> he was very happy to see me and wanted to hug me, although I knew that he was my dad. He was a stranger to me, and I was afraid to let him hug me. Yet this has become my internal regret. <laughs> The second time was when my father came back home after eight years illegal imprisonment. We could hardly recognize him, as he was tortured so badly. Only bone and skin left in his body. His hair turned gray. He was very skinny. Scars covered his body. The scars on his knees. And his ankle were not healed. There was, there were strangle marks on his neck. His abdomen showed the marks of electrons. Tabon's shock. It was very difficult for him to breathe. His mind was not clear. At night, he would suddenly hold his hand and squat at a corner in extreme fear. We made him all kind of delicious food, but he was unable to eat any. We had to bring him to the hospital. The doctor tried to draw his blood, but failed because he did not have enough blood. He died in the hospital due to his organ failure. Before he passed away, he yet off. Fallen Tafa is good, and truthfulness, compassion, tolerance is good. He died at the age of 38, 36. Then, in less than 100 days, and my uncle, my grandfather, and grandmother also passed away because of traumatic loss of my dad. No words could describe my mom's suffering at that time. I was only eight years old at that time. I was so scared that I would heal in a corner and cry. After that, I never had a stable life. When I was at third grade of my elementary school, I had to change school for four times because my mom was trying to seek justice in different levels of government. The last school I went was senior Lions School, which was up operated by Falun Gong practitioners. On October 22, 2013, many police officers came to my school and arrested many teachers and principals who were all Falun Gong practitioners. Fortunately, I ran away with a few classmates, but many of my classmates were taken away by the police. A boy named Ba Guanan, he was detained by for many days. The police deprived, deprived his sleep for four days and forced him to accuse his teachers. He was terrified and died of a mental breakdown a few days after returning home. 
the school taught us traditional Chinese culture and good values. I liked this school a lot, but it was closed by the police. Since then, I often woke up by nightmares for a long period of time. And someone must hold my hand so that I could fall asleep at night. Police put my mother on the wanted list. My mother and I had no permanent homes. We had to move from one place to another in order to avoid being arrested again. In February 2014, my mother and I accepted to Thailand. However, even after a we arrived arrived in Thailand, we still live in fear under the pursuit pursu of CCP. Thailand police arrested many Falun Gong practitioners in where, where we live. My mother and I were almost caught by the Thai police and put to immigration prison. We stayed in Thailand for three years. In three years, Thai police arrested nearly 30 Falun Gong practitioners and even want to risk her repatriated them because of their belief. I am now very fortunate to be accepted by the U.S. government to come to the United States. I no longer have to worry about being persecuted. I can believe in Falun Gong freely, go to school freely, and speak up for those persecuted people freely. However, the persecution in China still continues. Many children still suffer from the same fear as I did before. Some have become orphans and some are forced to separate from their parents. Some are displaced and cannot return home. And some children cannot normally attend school. And some children are discriminated against. All of this should be stopped immediately. I can I call on kind hearted people and government all of of all countries to take effective measures to help stop the this persecution. Thank you for your attention. Cindy, thank you for your emotional testimony, which we all have a sense of the heart, from your heart, what you have suffered. No child should endure the forced separation from her father merely because of a religious choice, a religious practice. Uh, we're so saddened and grieved at what you have suffered and what your mother has suffered and at the loss of your father for no reason. Any religious practice needs to be fully enjoyed by the practitioner. And we um, are just, again, grieved and saddened with what you've experienced. Thank you for sharing with us today. We're very grateful for your courage and boldness in what you've told us today. Our next witness testimony will be from Kalbiner Geni. Kalbiner grew up in Zhengjing and she lived until she traveled to study at university in Beijing. Between 2015 and 2017, Kalbiner studied for her master's degrees and PhD at the university in Malaysia and then, uh, until 2019, when the Malaysian embassy refused to renew her passport and requested that she returned to China. At that time, Kalbiner two cousins and uncle had been detained in a concentration camp in China. 
fearing that she would face a similar fate, Calvinair arrived in the United States to seek asylum, and she's currently advocating for the release of her family members. Calvinair, we welcome you to today's panel discussion, and we ask for your testimony that you would share it now. Thank you for your courage to join us today. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my story and the plight of children in my homeland. <clears throat> my name is Kalnur Reni, and I am an Uyghur. I born and raised in the Chechen county in the Uyghur region, and now I am one of the many thousands of Uyghurs living in exile, constantly worrying and worrying for the safety and well-being of my family and other loved ones in my homeland. The Uyghurs and other Turkic groups in my homeland face perhaps the darkest time in our history. China's genocide in the region has devastated the people in my homeland and those of us living in the diaspora. More than a million of souls have been detained in the massive network of concentration camps and the prisons. They face physical and psychological torture, rape, and other forms of sexual abuse, drugging, and other abuses of in the abuses. <laughs> Sorry. In addition to, of course, denunciation of their identity, religion, and the free thoughts. Those inside and outside the camps have been exploited for the forced and the coerced labor. Women have been subjected to forced birth control measures, including forced contract uh, contraceptives, forced sterilizations, forced abortions as part of China's effort to dilute the Uyghur population. Children have been separated from their families and taken away to state-run kindergartens, boarding schools, and orphanages where they are stripped of their identity and molded into loyal CCP subjects. Today, I want to speak to you about how Chinese genocide in my homeland has impacted me and my family, particularly my sister and my nephews. Like many of my fellow Uyghurs in the diaspora, I have, I have family and friends suffering in Chinese concentration camps and outside the camps under the constant surveillance. Since I started publicly advocating for my sister's release, the Chinese government has harassed me, telling me I must stop speaking out or I will not be able to see my sister and my mom alive again. The emotional stress I face is extreme. Every day I wonder if my remaining family members have been taken away or whose detention will I hear about next? Who else will I have to be worried for? My sister, <clears throat> sorry. My cousin sister Mahira Jafar was 21 years old, medical student, was among the first batch of camp victim she when she was detained in the August 2016. Her father, my uncle Jafar Timur, and my cousins Mama Jan Yusuf, Amina Hashim, Hazahan Kurdi, and Gilbahram Iman were taken in 2017. And my sister and I go when he was taken in 2018. I waited was with the hope and the fear, hoping my sister and the rest may be released if I stayed in silence, fearing that more will be taken if I spoke up. I spoke out publicly about my sister's detention for the first time in October 2019 because I was so desperate and hoped for international action. But three months ago, I learned that my sister and Agul had been sentenced to 17 years prison, seven years for praying when our father passed away in 2013, and additional 10 years for owning a Quran. The only Chinese government will deny that this is the religious persecution, and that's only can happen in China. My sister Rana Gul is 30 years, 38 years old and has a degree in art and literature. And she taught at the number one primary school in Chechen County for 18 years until her detention. She has two boys. Um, their name is Akhojan and Radhojan. 
Ako Jan is 15 years old and uh, the one other Jan is just mine. After detaining my sister, the government sent her husband to work in the remote village as for the punishment. My brother-in-law is only allowed to visit home, like come to see his sons once a month. Radul Jan is little one now with my mom, and then elder one, Akul Jan, is with my brother-in-law's family. Last year, the little Radul Jan, he attempted suicide multiple times, but fortunately, my mom was always there and then saved him. But he wanted his own mom, and the loving mom who took him to school every day and cooked his favorite food and hugged and kissed away his pain when he, when he got hurt. The Uncle John, the older one, was diagnosed with a major depressed just a couple of weeks ago after skipping school so many times and trying to harm himself. A child for the full and the harmonious development of his or her personality should grow up in the family environment in, his, <clears throat> in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. That's from the preamble of the UN Convention on the right of the child. State parties should ensure that the child not be separated from his or her parents against their will. That's from Article of 9 of the Convention and China signed Convention in 1990 and ratified it in 1992. Nearly 26 years after ratifying the Convention on the Rights of Child, the Chinese government destroyed my nephew's life and the, their happy family, whereas it is genocide of policies in our Uyghur homeland. Not just Uncle John and Radul Jans, the CCP has destroyed hundreds of thousands of Uyghur children's lives, separating them from their families and stripping them of their ethnic and religious identity. After the CCP, Sorry, the CCP will continue to destroy so much more, tear apart families, generations, and entire society and entire ethnic group if we remain silent and idle. Today, I stand up for my sister Rana Golgani and her sons, Akul Jan and Radul Jan, for the rest of my loved ones and the millions more souls suffering in my homeland because I want to. I want to be able to hug my nephews one day and tell them they were never alone. And then Auntie Kalmur fought for them and that their mom. I stand up because I have a voice and a flat platform in here. At least that I can do is amplify their silent cries. I stand up because there is a genocide in Uyghur homeland. And I stand up because I won't have a genocide on my conscience. There are those among you who are sympathetic. Maybe most of you, I hope, you will express your deepest concern and applaud me at the end of my speech. Many of you won't deny that it's genius. <clears throat> you won't deny that CCP horrific crimes against my people constitute genocide. Thank you, but that's not enough. That's not where your obligations into my nephews and the millions of Uyghur children who deserve to grow up in the family environment, in an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding, not in the midst of genocide. Your obligation is to take action to stop the genocide. Mitigate your fears of China now and to take concrete action to make, make this ongoing genocide extremely costly for China, economically and politically. So they will be forced to put an, put an end to this horrifying madness. Because if you let the CCP get away with this genocide and you rise to world power, your own children's chances for growing up in atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding will be at stake. Thank you. As a human to human, we so agree, every child should be allowed to grow up 
with happiness and environment of security within the home, their own home. Thank you, Kil Kilbener, for sharing your testimony. It's so powerful and it reveals again and again the deplorable inhumanity imposed by the Uyghur minority. We so agree with you that genocide is happening and the Chinese Communist Party is responsible, is engaged in it, is guilty of genocide. The US Department of State has made that determination. The Canadian Parliament has voted in, in agreement as to the genocide taking place. Other parliaments, the UK and others in Europe, are voting on the very same topic. And your voice is part of the community of voices that need to be heard, which expose the, the, the horrendous inhumanity and genocide. The international community must take action to protect and preserve the people of the Uyghurs as well, and in particular, the children and their rights. So again, thank you so much for your courageous testimony. We're very grateful for that today. Our next and final witness will be Arfat Erkin. Arfat was born and raised also in the Jinjia Uyghur Autonomous Region of China. As a Uyghur and son of a prominent Uyghur journalist, he faced persecution for his and his family's beliefs. In school, he and other Uyghur students were forced to sign pledges that they would not practice their religion. At the age of 18, Arfat came to the United States as a college student, and he later learned that his father and mother were placed in detention camps in Jinjing. Arfat now advocates for his father's release, and Arfat, we welcome you to join us today, and please share your testimony as to what is happening there in that region. Thank you, Arfat. Thank you, thank you for organizing this event and uh, all the previous speakers. Um, a child for the full and harmonious development of their personality should grow up in a family environment, in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. This is directly from the UN Convention on the Right of Child, child that China has signed on to with the, the promise of protection a convention that China has blatantly violated. Right now, as I speak, the Chinese Communist Party is uprooting Uyghur children by thousands from their families and communities with the intention to strip them of their ethnic and religious identity. This crackdown on Uyghur children's right to religion and sense of identity is not something new, but the packet of oppressive treatment of Tibetans, Falun Gong uh, children, and many more. Even before China rapidly built concentration camps across the so-called Uyghur Autonomous Region. We were forced to leave our faith and identity behind. We were not permitted to study Quran, enter mosque, or observe Ramadan, forcing us to learn about the practice of our faith in secret. With the world failing to hold China accountable for those gross violations, Chairman Xi has only been encouraged to increase this persecution of Uyghurs into an actual genocide. While continuing to spread these oppressive tactics to other groups of faith as well. The Chinese Communist Party continues to accelerate its strike hard campaign against Uyghurs and urged its officials to show no mercy as they detain. By China's own admission in the recent white paper, as many as 1.3 million Uyghurs and other ethnic natives of the region per year for so-called involuntary re in concentration camps, surrounded by barbed wire and watchtowers. And those Uyghurs outside of the camps, they're subjected to living in a high-tech enabled or really in a surveillance police state. Yet the United Nations continues to fail Uyghur young and old by continuing to stay silent against China's flagrant violations of the Convention on the Right of Child and frankly, the Genocide Convention. Since 2017, we have continued to hear testimonies after testimony of Uyghurs receiving news of detained and disappeared family members. If these fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents continue to be taken, I cannot help but wonder what is happening to their children. I've been through China's um, school system in the region. I've witnessed as they belittle my Uyghur identity year after year. These oppressive tactics hurt me and other Uyghur children from our faith, language, culture, 
and instilled us uh, a fear of the Chinese government to, to a point they were able to silence me even when I came to the United States. I was only able to gather courage to stand up when they took my parents into the camp in 2002 and I began to began the slow motion genocide against Uyghurs by denying it at the same time. If I was scared to speak up even when I'm even when I'm in the United States, so how are the children within China's today's borders in the hands of the Chinese government enduring? As the Chinese Communist uh, Party picked millions of Uyghurs, young and old, from students, teachers, scholars, doctors, and journalists, they're increasingly tearing apart the fabrics of Uyghur society. So what's happening to their children? They're rolled off into concentration camps under different labels. They're drunk in their gardens, boarding schools, or orphanages. In December 2019, the New York Times reported that nearly half a million Uyghur and Turkish children have been separated from their families taken away from the family environment, away from happiness and love and understanding, and forcibly placed into strange facilities run by state intent to destroy their family bonds, their language, their religion, their culture, their identity, their world, intent on stripping away their humanity and re-engineering them into loyal Chinese subjects of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, a year later, research show new pension facilities and extensive forced labor schemes have been built. How many more children during this expansion have joined the rank of kids for the very from stable home? How many more children have joined the stolen generation? Imagine the psychological pain children are subjected to when they suddenly separated from their family members or being subjected to enter to home stays from the Chinese official where a stranger insists on sleeping in a bad business. Imagine the fear the children are growing up in, constantly chanting mindless CCP slogans knowing the government can take away everything they hold dear at any moment. With, the British uh, with China's British control in Uyghur homeland, where an Associate Press report shows a 60% decrease in birth rate from 2016 to 2018, or research revealing that China plans to subject 80% of women to in intrusive breast prevention surgeries. This is an attack not on not just on the Uyghur children of now, but the Uyghur children of the future. This is the reason that has prompted countries to now declare what is happening as a genocide. But we can't take back the generation China has stolen from us. We can reunite the children with their families to grow up in a home surrounded by family, happiness, love, and understanding. Every member country of the United Nations is obligated to prevent these genocide act, genocidal actions. To uphold the reasons that the United Nations was created in the first place. To put your words so never again, to action. Each one of us has responsibility to their children. To our future, we will be rem remember how we acted today. Please stand up to stop these crimes against humanity and send a message, no matter who, the United Nations is here to protect humanity. Or will you and your country stay silent at the face of genocide, diminishing all the United Nations, all that the United Nations can? Thank you. Thank you very much, Arafat, for your sharing of your uh, testimony and also pointing out how the international community does need to come together to stop what we're seeing within uh, the Chinese efforts to exterminate uh, an entire people group. It's unbelievable that China is doing that and more of the international community is not speaking out against it. We must, we must change that, reverse that. And your voice is so important for us to hear as you um, experience and as your family is personally experience the atrocities that are taking place. We're going to turn now to a time of question and answer. We do have some questions that have come in, but we invite all participants uh, who would like to provide questions to put them in either the chat box or the question function and we'll do our best to get to them in the next um, 10 minutes or so. Our first question 
is from Mahmoud Metwali. He's from Mott for Peace Development and Human Rights Association in Egypt, in Cairo, Egypt. We welcome your participation with this question. And uh, Mahmoud's question is, in your opinion, why did the international community not take an immediate steps and adopt strong and effective pressure methods against China to stop violating the human rights, in particular against children? I would like to uh, address that question to um, our Commissioner Turkle and also to Bob Fu. Uh, again, the question is why has not international community taken more swift and prompt action in light of these human rights violations? Commissioner Turkle, are you able to uh, provide uh, a response to this question? Uh, yes, thank you so much. I appreciate the question. It's an important question. The, um, in the face of the mounting uh, pressure, uh, uh, public discussion, and uh, incredible reporting by uh, investigative journalists and, and, and scholars, the international community's response has been tepid and, and mean daring. Um, only the US government has been uh, historic and unprecedented in the policy decisions, uh, executive and legislative decisions and actions been announced, uh, particularly last year and early this year. Um, two reasons for international communities uh, relative silence on the issues. One, um, China has done an incredible uh, job um, manipulating, uh, buying a silence uh, in weaker uh, countries around the world. Uh, as it has been uh, the case, uh, as demonstrated in the case of this joint letter that the China has managed uh, to put together uh, with the support of some countries with dismal uh, human rights records. Former Secretary of State called it um, uh, accurately in saying that China has its own league uh, uh, for human rights violations. Um, in democratic countries and liberal democracies, uh, silence has a lot to do with uh, entanglement in the, uh, the economic uh, aspect of their relationship with, uh, with communist China. So it's, it's a matter of conscience. It's just a matter of time, I believe, uh, for them to revisit and, and, and come to a realization that it is untenable for any country, uh, any political leader, uh, business leader, uh, luminaries uh, to go about a business as usual and uh, engage in uh, whatever the relationship that they have with this genocidal regime in Beijing. Uh, the international community have seen or experienced three genocidal campaigns in less than 10 years. First against the Yazidis uh, uh, in, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, and the, uh, the Rohingya Muslims by the uh, Myanmar junta. And now the Uyghur genocide uh, orchestrated by uh, Communist Party uh, government in China. So the international community silence uh, a lukewarm response uh, or concerning more about the economic interest over uh, moral obligation uh, may uh, give a wrong idea, uh, uh, if not an encouragement to bad actors to uh, design and formulate and execute genocidal campaigns. I worry uh, which country would, would be the next, uh, which religious minority would be the next target uh, is the kind of question that I often wonder. Uh, stopping Uyghur genocide is as important as preventing the next genocide. So I use this opportunity to call on uh, the leaders in power, uh, whether in government or in business, uh, to, uh, to do a, a conscionable thing, uh, to get on the right side of the history. History will not be kind to those who are entangled in their economic uh, interest, political expediencies, uh, over their moral obligation to, to do what is right uh, for their country and also for humanity. 
Well said, Commissioner Turco. We appreciate the additional um, background and context that you're given. It's so absolutely true that the international community once again has another, op a third opportunity to stand up to prevent um, the atrocities from continuing. Um, we must we must join together in doing so, and there needs to be political fortitude around the globe to do that. It definitely must include business leaders and um, other, you know, tech industries. Um, Jubilee campaign provided a letter to condemn essentially the the fact that Disney is producing a film right in the backyard of where these concentration camps are taking place and said nothing about it. We can't allow that to happen in secrecy and we can't believe the propaganda of the Chinese Communist Party. We have to, as an international community, stand up and oppose that. Um, Bob Fu, did you want to comment on that question as well? And um, if you're still on with us, it would be uh, helpful to receive your perspective. Thank, thank you. And um, I. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we're yes. Go ahead. Thank Go ahead. you. Um, thank you. I appreciate the um, also the input, the answer by Commissioner uh, Turkle. I think it's um, imperative. It's not only uh, morally imperative, religious imperative, but really legally imperative. Now. We have the, uh, the international community, especially the U.S. administration. I mean, both the previous Trump administration and even the current administration have um, unanimously agreed this is a genocide, crime against humanity. Where is the outcry? We need a united front outcry from all humanity. It's just, um, I think, um, um, I applaud the decision to sanction those uh, perpetrators like uh, in Xinjiang. For the first time, the Trump administration uh, for decades uh, already, I mean, it sanctioned the uh, Politburo members it, uh, the, uh, under the Global Magnitsky Act. Um, but um, it's uh, really not uh, enough. I hope um, the Biden administration uh, yeah, is uh, at least rhetoric uh, said it will take a, a multilateral approach um, to get the European Union. I mean, that's really uh, one uh, Western bloc that had uh, done nearly nothing. Actually, while the genocide was designated, the European Union signed a trade deal with the perpetrators, with the Chinese Communist Party regime. What kind of signal the Europeans wants to send to the, the, these uh, uh, violators? I think uh, another thing I want to point out is this uh, Islamic countries. Where is your conscience of your faith? I mean, when the majority of this uh, one to three million uh, uh, in the concentration camp are fellow Muslims. And uh, the dis most disgusting thing was uh, under Chinese Communist Party's uh, United Front internationally, they brought even some Islamic countries, praising them, setting up the concentration camp as a way of so-called uh, de-extremism, anti-terrorism. Nothing further is from, you know, is true. So this is, uh, pure propaganda. I think we, we, we do need a, a, a real uh, a, a international united outcry like uh, we did during the Holocaust, during the, uh, the apartheid in South Africa. So where is the courage? I think we, as uh, Anne, you just mentioned, it does requires now 
uh, uh, leadership um, and uh, um, uh, not only political leadership, not business leadership. Um, it's, it, it's time really to to like uh, to boycott uh, this 2022 Beijing Olympics. Uh, how can the world, with a good conscience, to continue business as usual, engaging the, this uh, regime, committing genocide um, against so many? Uh, so that's my uh, outcry and uh, my appeal to all of us to do something together. Thank you, Bob. We definitely um, appreciate your additional amplification of how too often the policies of governments actually contradict uh, what they say about the, their own value system, such as the European community having a trade agreement in the midst of the known facts of what's taking place in the Zhejiang province. So we we must hold them accountable for the failure to actually hold China accountable. And um, in the closing uh, time frame, um, I'd like to address the question, how can China ensure the human rights of all its children? I think it's very straightforward that China needs to abide by international standards of the community of, of nations, which, which is, codified, if you will, in the convention, such as the Convention on the Rights of a Child, which China itself has become a signatory to that. And in light of that, Jubilee Campaign has prepared a shadow report. We call it a shadow report because China has not submitted its uh, response to um, uh, its treaty obligation under the Convention on the Rights of a Child. Its, its report has been due for two years. As we stated earlier, it's not provided its report. Secondly, um, it's, 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 China has refused to permit any uh, international observance or criticism of its uh, policies and practices. And so we have titled our report a shadow report. And uh, it's basically a hundred page uh, shadow complaint uh, that we're presenting to the Committee on the Rights of a Child titled China Bans Faith for All Children. We'll be providing a link to this report. And what we're trying to do is show that youngest believers in China have been repressed. The testimonies today reveal not only how they've been repressed, but how they've been themselves persecuted. No child should be forcefully separated from their parent. As one of our earlier speakers shared um, how she had not seen her father except for twice in her lifetime uh, before he died after the deplorable and horrible conditions he suffered while in prison where he lost weight and was thin, et cetera. None of those experiences should be faced by any child, much less children in China. And so um, we will be providing a link uh, to where you can receive and obtain a copy of this uh, crucial report that we hope to continue to amplify the fact that China is in violation of its international obligations. Um, essentially, it's China is two years late um, in presenting its defense. And sadly to say, it's because China is unable to provide a defense for its, its deplorable actions. Um, our witnesses today have testified and revealed the deplorable level of restrictions and limitations to the exercise of religious belief, worship, and practice. As Bob Fu referenced in his early remarks, it's also the rights of parents that have been violated. The rights of parents are also uh, reflected in the, in the Convention on the Rights of a Child. And regrettably, the rights of parents are also um, been deprived and stripped uh, within China. Um, and we, we, as the international community, must stand together and must stand against Chinese aggression 
Chinese aggression against its own citizens. And in fact, um, as the international community is making declarations of China has violated and is committing genocide. With the violation on the Convention of Genocide, the international community must hold China accountable for this. And we look forward with engaging in the near future on continuing efforts to hold China accountable. We would like to thank all of our panelists today for participating, especially the victims who have shared their stories and uh, revealed how their families have suffered so severely at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. We'd like to thank all of the, the uh, people who have uh, listened to this uh, event today. We will be providing it online uh, through a link that will circulate later. Uh, and we invite everyone who um, is involved today to please um, share the link and get the word out that the situation in China must uh, end. We must put an end to the genocide against the Uyghurs and we must put an end to the ban on faith for all children. Thank you all for participating today.